Better Conversations and Relationships. I've designed this book to take courageous individuals like you on a personal journey around and through various relationships so that you can find ways to explore improved well being for yourself physically, emotionally, and mentally, and in the communities and systems in which you live, work, and serve. First, I want to say that the purpose of this book is to start a healthy conversation and healing process around the topic of relationships, family, friends, colleagues, networks, groups, and our culture, post-pandemic and beyond. As I write this, we are, hopefully, on the tail end of two years of one of our most impactful global events our generation has experienced, a pandemic. It changed the course of human interaction globally in some dramatic and unfortunate ways. While you may be ready to argue details and facts about the virus, its origin, etc., I'd like to focus our attention on the inarguable facts of how this experience has impacted our culture and especially our relationships. There are inevitable effects to our well-being caused by social distancing and masks. The toxic stress and perhaps trauma perpetuated by the words and tone chosen by media and government. The regulations, economic upheaval, fear of being close to others, and debates about politics and vaccines have caused rifts and challenges in relationships in almost every direction imaginable. I'll address confirmation bias and belief perseverance later in this book, and I've done my best to avoid these phenomena in the research and writing of this book. I've had test readers with different backgrounds, beliefs, and skills read it and give me feedback and criticism so I can provide information in a fairly unbiased and simple way. I also realize that, as much as I try, I'm not innocent in all of this either. While the cultural experience I have come from and those I have interacted with over the years are those of a mostly white, cisgendered, heterosexual, middle-class American Midwestern attitude and belief structure, I want to assure you that this content is meant to be inclusive of all, no matter how you identify in sex, politics, religion, or race. My intent is to demonstrate the deeper workings of human connection throughout cultures and lifestyles and history. These are important subjects that have shaped our current culture and will continue to do so, whether we are attuned to how they do or not. Now is the time to explore our desires to connect beyond social media and cell phones and bring back relationship communication that either heals, nourishes, and bonds the connection, or that gently acknowledges the relationship has run its course and lets the other go in a respectful, non-judgmental, and gentle manner. Some people talk about wishing things would go back to normal. Others say to get used to the new normal. And I say, we have an incredible opportunity before us to not only reconnect after realizing how much we need each other, but to recreate relationship dynamics for ourselves personally and collectively. Will you join me? How to get the most out of this book. Long before COVID, we were listening to and experiencing the impact of verbal and nonverbal messages about relationships, since we were little, in fact. And the stories, lessons, and even the research I am about to share with you could shine a light on your belief systems. That means you will likely find yourself surprised or even upset by what you experience in this book. When it happens, celebrate it. This is meant to get you curious about what you believe about both yourself and others when it comes to touch, consent, communication, trauma, and connection of all types. In addition to my journey through interpersonal relationships in my life, and especially as I work to renegotiate them through the time of COVID, you will find research and studies that demonstrate important facts about our bodies and relationships. You will see why I feel 
healthy, consensual touch is still so important in our culture to build and maintain relationships, even though history demonstrates we may never touch each other as a culture in the same way again. I will cite research that shows just how important touch is for our physical well-being as well as mental and emotional health. You will not only discover how our beliefs can be formed not only by our DNA, energy vibrations, and brain wiring, but also how life experiences of all kinds influence and reinforce those thoughts and beliefs until they guide us in our actions and reactions at all levels of our lives, often without us even being aware of what is driving us. Welcome to the complex and beautiful dance between your brain, ego self, shadow self, soul, and spirit. My goal is to help bring healthy communication, curiosity, compassion, and empathy into the challenging world of relationships. You will see me using some of the healing tools and modalities that I've used and share with my clients, and you will see some of my own mistakes and fears so that you will know you are not alone when you feel challenged. You will also see how other people I know and have interviewed make choices so you can lean into what fits for you and your lifestyle, as well as have a broader cultural and global understanding. Plus, I try to keep my humor through it all. Finally, there are a couple of questions at the end of each chapter to help guide you. You can find those and the other resources on the touchremedies.com website to find support and additional opportunities for exploration or healing. When you start to feel. As I have already indicated, this book may bring up big emotions for you, and there is no right way or wrong way to feel about any of it. In fact, you will likely find yourself resisting certain parts of this book. You may want to judge me, my people, or this book when I tell stories or explore ideas that are broad based and may even seem judgmental. What I know is that these processes and experiences were not easy for anyone involved, even when it may appear worded as such. Some of you love to debate and are going to be ready to send me messages or emails as you read something that is emotionally stirring for you. I encourage you to take a moment, really tune in to what you are feeling and experiencing, and ask why. What is underneath the trigger or reaction for you? I welcome clear-minded and respectful debates. If you choose to attack me or my words, I will probably notice that you are in deeper pain than you realize and then make a choice for myself about whether it feels constructive, safe, and appropriate to respond in any way. In other words, I will try to practice what I'm about to preach here. A wise woman once told me, you are doing your job if people want to both run towards your message and run away from it. There is the balance I am attempting, dear reader, to stir up our shadow side, to generate enough curiosity, to create deeper awareness and possibility for change, but in the most gentle, loving, and open way possible. The Science to understand the sensory life of a society, one must look at the cultural values that inform its ways of sensing the world. The history of the touch involves not just a search for experience, but for meaning. Constance Klassen, The Deepest Sense In the Middle Ages, touch was not only natural, it was an integral part of daily family and community life. Families slept in the same bed for the simple necessity of space and warmth. Soldiers, when eating, ate with their hands out of bowls set in the center of the table. It was believed this demonstrated equality and strong bonds between the men, especially as their superior officers would participate. Unaware of germs, viruses, and bacteria, Individuals found community and camaraderie in this primitive yet meaningful connection. When eating utensils were first devised, they were used only by the ruling class, 
who were often made fun of for their delicate ways. In the same way some young girls dream of being princesses or superheroes, many humans have an innate desire to have more wealth, more power, or more influence in comparison to others who they perceive to be peers. In fact, a study by researchers at the University of Warwick and Cardiff University has found that money, after basic survival needs are met, only makes people happier if it improves their social rank. The drive to increase personal and familial status led individuals to imagining what it would be like to live in a house where there were separate beds and utensils with which to eat. People started moving away from such a familiar way of touching and interacting. Religion became involved. Textiles became softer. Separation began to occur. Then the Black Plague came along. As Constance Classen writes in the book, The Deepest Sense, experience of quick and deadly contagion during the Black Death furthermore made people fearful of close contact with their fellows and contributed to a shrinking sacred touch. Several hundred years later, I discovered there was another touch crisis happening in our culture long before the pandemic. In fact, I was just finishing a book on the topic when the pandemic started. After speaking about the importance of healthy, consensual touch, I was encouraged by many to write a book. I found myself traveling Europe, immersing myself into and meeting people from various cultures and learning about the various ways people connect and use physical contact. I was concerned about the lack of communication, especially around touch, in our culture and started writing. Then, bam, the pandemic hit and changed everyone's experience around touch and connection. Although the pandemic did us a service by allowing us to tune in to our wants, needs, and desires around physical contact, it also changed the level of comfort around something as simple as a handshake. Because I'd already figured out my own beliefs and desires around touch, I'd ask people to respect their desires. Are you doing handshakes, elbow bumps, or staying at a distance? Sometimes I didn't have to ask, as my reputation as a hugger precedes me and people would come in for whatever level of touch they were comfortable with, assuming I was good with it, which I was. In the last two years, I've observed a lack of clear communication and conversation regarding people's wants and needs for personal touch and contact in many arenas, but especially in the family dynamic. Older or at-risk individuals asking for in-person contact with their loved ones, grandchildren, and friends, and being denied, the latter group being too fearful of getting the at-risk person ill. Of course, the strongest boundaries win, always. Yet, I question, is this the healthiest choice? Are we letting fear separate us? Are we weighing the possibility that the person we are trying so hard to protect could die anyway from a stroke or heart attack tomorrow? What if that touch and connection might have supported their mental and emotional well-being and immune system? I ask these questions, of course, because of how much research I've done on the power of touch to keep us physically and emotionally healthy. In a Carnegie Mellon University study, 404 people were measured on their perceived social support and number of hugs received per day. They were then exposed to a flu virus and put in quarantine for observation. People were less likely to be symptomatic if they had good social support. Plus, among infected participants, greater perceived support and more frequent hugs each predicted less severe illness signs. You will learn more about this, but when the fight-or-flight part of the brain is less active, our immune system is more able to respond to stress and illness.